Good morning, reader listeners, TV viewers, and our followers on social media. This is your program, The Morning Show with El Elton Jones, and a pleasant Monday to you. Do have a very productive week further. Today, we have some special guests in the house. Uh, I would like to introduce my good friend, Mr. Yesarun, and uh, Madam Claire Elshot from the Consumer Coalition, the Chamber of Labor Unions, Anti-Poverty Platform, and these lady and gentlemen have wear many hats but believe me they have the prerequisite experience to talk about them all good morning lady and gentlemen good morning mr jones and good morning to your listeners viewers etc and followers so good morning morning mr jones mr uh, mama pearl mama's pearl and all your radio listeners the viewers that are looking at us and listening to us have a blessed week Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna we can use whatever time we want, but we don't want to waste any of it. So let's go. I want to start with the um, the implementation or the enforcement of this um, labor policy that's not so new. After all, it's been around since 1979, and none of the governments before, including the one that I saw, saw it fit to implement it or to do anything about it. And it's creating a lot of stir because the the interim minister of VSR has decided to do something to assist locals to get along in this country. So let's start there. First of all, your opinion on the implement enforcement, and secondly, the amount of hurrah that has been caused around it. Well, if I may start as um, the Windward Island Chamber of Labor Union's president, we recently had a meeting, which was Thursday gone, with the minister, and all unions were, were present except for uh, NAPB. And in that meeting, um, the minister gave an outline of exactly how and what was done to this policy. Indeed, um, in a number of presentations, even in Parliament, the minister indicated that this is not a new policy and basically indicated which areas within the policy that has um, gotten based on her discretion as a minister and the article 6 that gives her that right to do that and uh, basically the areas in which um, the regulation of recruitment and basically um, how we would say the decision that she have to take when she have to sign off on a request for a foreign employment permit, how that now would be in terms of um, the law, how that would be regulated. So basically, we have a lot that been sitting there, have not been published, have not been um, sharpened a little, and the labor office, um, the, the departments are seeing how certain loopholes are being utilized, especially when um, the vacancy list has to be filled in, the exotic and type of um, uh, type of description that are given to certain vacancies. That when you break it down in simple terms, are jobs that locals can do. So um, the whole crux of the matter was that this now was published in the National Gazette because when you on a one-to-one -one basis with an employer you try to deal with certain things and the employer would say but wait will you get this from how come I never knew about this so for it to be public knowledge it was published and the whole hula who that it is creating we have as um, unions sat with the minister analyze the ILO requirement, so decent work at, as the number one requisite, and with from the explanation that was given, um, it was um, all the unions unanimously supported and agree with the Minister of Labor on this policy. So I heard across the room, Minister, you have our full support. Now, one of the things that surfaced this weekend was on Facebook, the article in which is saying that um, basically 
there was a labor policy reform that was being um, pursued within the tripartite committee. Um, I have to note here that whatever took place between 2016, it did stop. In 2018, we as a tripartite recognized for example, the, pro the point of the abuse of the short-term contract and something has to be done by the Minister of Labor, um, who was then Minister Emily Lee. And then it even went broader to say we need a labor reform, you know, and a reform on that area. But the reform did not say that we have to flexibilize the labor market and just, you know, do away with our regulations where it pertains to the foreign labor policy. No mention was made of that. So I need to shed some clarity on that. In addition to that, um, basically, they went to name the persons that were in that, um, you know, in the committee, the tripartite committee. That tripartite committee, after we handle, you know, the paternity and maternity leave, that you know it's not that it ceased to exist it's just that um no more dormant it, no more meetings were called until the minister was actually moved out of office there were new ministers coming in no more um meetings so if you look at what we are saying today as unions we have a total different scenario than back in 2016 also because we have a St. Martin that has a high amount of unemployment. We all know that due to the fact that we had um, this tremendous hurricane and a lot of properties got damaged in the hospitality field, hotels, etc. We know that a lot of jobs was lost. There were things that was put in place, let's say people that was reshuffled, that used to work in the hotel now got gardener, maintenance, um, even security of those properties while they're rebuilding. And we know that there are a number of jobs once the rebuilding process of some of those hotels are finalized that are going to come off the line um, within all sectors of the hotels, okay? Within or from, from let's say, from the time you're checking in, uh, the whole area of the hotels, which most hotels are now timeshare or all-inclusive, but even in that aspect, a lot of jobs are going to come. So what is it that, uh, um, what is so wrong that a policy maker or, or um, how you would say, the Minister of Labor in her country is going to stipulate that, listen, we have to be seriously attacking the unemployment. And as unions, we would even go a little further because it's not policies for unemployment alone. We are now saying we have underemployment in this country also. So basically, they have started with a process of looking for the most critical skill areas that people need to be in power. Since we're going to have a lot of construction, etc., make IT, which is a... a a type of um, how you would say they, they prepare people for the labor market and it's from actually Trinidad they were brought in in the NIPA which is rightfully a uh, advanced um, how it was Institute the National Institute for professional advancement in the NIPA and also in addition to that they are now also at USM making sure that your labor force can be um, how is it, upgraded in terms of um, the skills that are needed. And when you upgrade people with certain skills that are going to be needed, are you going to be upgrading them for, Angu for Anguilla Saber Station? It's for your own local market. So basically you need to see the spin-off of that investment being put back in your labor market when those building uh, projects are starting. 
I don't feel that we should import labor from Timbuktu or anywhere else if we have those expertise here. So now there is going to be an arrangement within the labor office to be able to also match people that needs um, that are registered as unemployed to match them to certain vacancies that once the application comes in for a, for a foreign worker and you check and see the vacancy list or, or the, the summary of what are the skills that is expected from this worker and if you have a match in the labor market tell me what is wrong with the minister insisting fire regulations that that vacancy should be filled first by locals this is unheard of in any society that the minister would then be called to order by groups of whether you say social partners you call them but in the indecent and disrespectful way that they are called to order she was not invited to have um, a dialogue where they can point out their grievances or anything they did not um, how he was a table their their um, concerns or even ask for a presentation or interaction so that they could fully understand they just jump on this um, piece of law and went ahead very disrespectful tearing the minister apart in um, oh mm. demanding that she have to retract this law no as labor we have no heard we got an invitation we were there present we got the presentation every single union that was there present including the ufa we all agree Lab um minister you have done the right thing we fully support you as unions so basically based on ilo perception of decent work and what should um, be prescribed as decent work we see no um, unless somebody proves it different we see no objections with what has been done so far Mr. Yesurun your take on the same issue well as a senior citizen representative we also have experienced in the past the discrimination when employers have to choose who they are going to employ for their vacancies. One of the main things that we see is when we too old or too overqualified, they put us aside. So as seniors, with that experience in our society, we are happy that the minister is opening the possibility that all locals will be targeted first before they look for el elsewhere um, um, people to employ that come from abroad. So we're happy with that. We were even part of the meeting that the minister uh, called with the labor unions. And we call it foresight of this minister. Because you know that all the people that is not formally employed, because usually with the unions, it's only those that are formally employed. And through the companies, the union is getting their contributions. They are being represented by the unions. And the unions, every so now and then they talk about the others, but the reality is that all the others, they are not in the formal labor, in the formal economy. They are in the informal economy, they are in the informal sector of labor, and they have no protection at all. And the seniors are in that sector too. Because as long as we don't have a formal job, as you know, we're out of that, but we still have to make the ends meet. We have seniors that, for instance, have a car and they are gypsy to get an extra income. They give their service and they get a little income, they get money. There are seniors that have, for instance, their apartment. Now, what I try to tell you here is that what the minister is trying to do is give us all, that's how we see it, mm -hmm. that are still capable to work, 
and still interested to work, the right to work. And that's where we say, hooray, because now there is this piece of ministerial decree that says, this is how I implement the policy to protect locals first, to give opportunities for locals first, before I sign off to a request to bring in foreign labor. So I fully agree with that. We are happy with that. We hope that we will be targeted now to get jobs too. Okay, um, one of the things, are, you know, when, when you're 18 years or around there, you come out of school, you go look for a job, you don't have the experience, you don't. And if you're 40, you're too old, so I don't know when we're going to get a job. But one of the things you want to get clear is these things are passed around a lot in the community and people are wondering about them. We have the unemployed, mm -hmm. so we can explain what we have. The unemployed, what is unemployable? How do you define unemployable? Unemployable, then, of course, because we, as you rightfully say, we have the unemployed. Those are people that have the rights to work and that are capable of working, but they don't have a job or a vacant job. You have underemployed. Those are people that are in the labor market, in and out, short-term contracts probably, or not even full employed as um, is required, let's say the eight, the eight hour work week, you know, five days or six days a week, mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. underemployed. If you only have, uh, let's say three days a week or two days a week. And the other one, those are the unemployable. Those are the people that would, would fall on a special category because they cannot be employed no matter what. So probably under that you can look at uh, some, some forms of handicaps because it is not true <laughs> that all handicaps cannot be employed. They are universally um, a number of areas that can be adapted in the workplace to be able to accommodate and employ those persons that have physical handicaps, etc. But that for me would be the group that would fall in the un underemployed or non-employable. I would be careful with Go ahead. Because the ILO, the International Labour Organization, when they speak about respect for the right to work, they say it's for all. They don't exclude nobody. Only when you are a minor, children mm. are excluded. What does it mean? Even when you have a disability, you have the right to work. So, the, the, in the vocabulary of, let's say, the worker or the human being, there's not such a thing as I am not employable. Unemployable, that's in the vocabulary of employers. Mm. So, we don't like to talk like an employer. We like to talk from the perspective of defendants of the rights of the worker and of the human beings. So careful when we copy certain terms, who we are actually speaking for. This is so important. I give you this example for you to see. Just now you was asking, how many people, for instance. I'm coming back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are unemployed <coughs> and then you see even the minister in parliament said that the consumer coalition had almost doubled the amount of people that she had calculated that are unemployed now when we start to look at figures when we start to talk about who is employed who's unemployed right something has to be very clear you talk from which perspective so the minister, that's representative of government, have a government perspective. But we as consumers, we are paying TOT, that is turnover tax. And so we all have the same right to be treated equally. Now when we talk about the right to work, then we all that are paying our TOT, whatever item that we buy in this society, we also have the right to work. 
And so when you want to talk about how many people have a job in formal sector, that's where you come back with your definition of employed, <coughs> then you have an amount. Then you come with your underemployment definition. Okay, you say that's the people that don't have a full-time work week, a full-time job. That's a part-time job. Okay, then you say they are underemployed, underemployed. But then, unemployable, that's not in our vocabulary. Our <laughs> vocabulary says everybody has the right to work. When you have those employed, those underemployed, all the others still have to be employed. That's our definition. Others have to be employed. Okay, let's go back to the figures. The, the minister presented during the parliamentary meeting called by the up faction to what end, I don't know. But that um, according to government data, there are about 6,600 people unemployed. And then she compared it with the com consumer coalition's figures that said 11,300 and a bit. Where are we getting these figures from? How do we substantiate it? And does the people in short-term contracts fall into that? Okay, may I ask, uh, may, may, may I first ask, when the minister said <coughs> she has 6,600 people mm -hmm. that she is eyeing as yeah. being unemployed, mm -hmm. She said in Parliament, that's based on the labor force survey of 2018. Yeah. We are now in 2020. You expect from government to tell you how much people now need employment. So that's an old figure. We went to look if we could get the figure from now, and we went online, we went on all the websites from government and all of that. Now, finally, the last figure that even the World Bank has used was from the Labor Force Survey of 2018. So what we did, compared the 2018 Labor Force Survey data with what do they say about unemployment? In that Labor Force Survey, it was not 6,000. It was 2,300 something that they mentioned as being unemployed. We said, how many people are employed? And that amount was 20,000. 20,850. 20,850. Look at her. She has the mm -hmm. press conference <laughs> that we held last week. So what can I tell you? First of all, government start with all the people from 15 years and older, and the labor force survey also. So how many people in 2018 had the age of 15 years and older? Why we look at all those people? Be all of them have the right to work. So when we look at that amount, it's 32,500 almost, right? In 2018. So if I have 32,500, and I take the 20, Thousand, so I am left with eleven thousand something. These are all the peoples that did not have their right to work realized in 2018, the time of the survey. So what was our take on it? The World Bank, together with the Dutch, they gave this emergency income support and training program, and put money to make employable, as they called it, 1,800 persons. So if we have 11,000 persons that were not employed in 2018, and in 2018, these people of World Bank government, the Dutch government decided, we are going to give 1,800, we are going to make employable, 1,800. Where are the other 9,000 then? When will they become employable? So we said, <laughs> this is what we look at. They're all consumers. We have to defend all these consumers. Why you give only a few this right opportunity to become employable? We applaud it, but when comes the money for the rest? So based on the right to work, our figure 
is addressing all the people that have the right to work and was not working at that time. But now we're on 2020. We want to know what is the reality now. Yeah? So with that said, when the minister come up with figures, she get them from her departments. That is government definitions. One of the things that we discovered in the labor force survey is that the 2,300 that they was mentioning there as unemployed was the people that during the time of the survey, two weeks before the survey, were actively looking for a job. So if you was not actively looking for a job, in the statistic they said inactive, all the rest. But if we have the right to work, from a perspective of protecting the right to work, you have to create jobs for all. You have to make everybody employable. And that's what we brought up. So mm -hmm. don't take our figure out of the context and come and tell us that this is exaggerated because there were parliamentarians that had to defend the right to work for all the people in this society that criticized the fact that we came with the number. Instead of them trying to understand, there was only one parliamentarian that after the meeting in parliament came to see, hey, where did you get this number from? That was MP Westcott Williams. And when we explained her, based on the right to work, how many people did not realize their right from 2018, and how important it is to look at that and make them all get the same opportunity to be employable, that was the training program, that's where we said, look at that. That was the context. And then when you say, okay, these people were not working. So they were unemployed. Right? So when we look at figures and when we look at data, the first thing that we have to do is who are we talking about? Everybody has the right to work? Then put all these people up. That should be your number that you have to target, that you have to work for, that you have to defend. That's what we did. So whoever comes now to criticize us, saying that we come up with numbers just like that. No, sir. Respect all these people out here. And if you as government provided us with that number, we repeat it and we will tell it. Why? Question comes now. Why you think government doesn't want the people to know that there's over 10,000 people since 10, 10, 10, every year, look at the labor force surveys that had not realized their right to work. Now that we say, no, you want to bash us and you want to criticize, why government didn't want you to know that there's more than 10,000 people that was not employed formally? Because I can answer it. They was never interested to do something about that for them to get employment. And with that said, you see, when we spoke just now about there's a difference between the formal sector and the informal sector. A lot of people, when they don't have a formal job, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Side thing, a side job in the informal sector. And what is so characteristic of doing something in the informal sector for you to survive? No premium money, no tax. And what is worse, no benefits. So you try to survive, but you're not protected. And we say, that is what is missing. And with all the respect for the labor reform discussions that took place, as we started to tell the minister in the meeting, we that are in the informal sector, we are invisible for you. But we're happy that you bring us in because now we can tell you we need more protection. So where the labor unions is talking for the 20,000, the informal sector, the anti-poverty platform, the consumer coalition is talking for, the, for them and for the rest. The 11,000 must be addressed and their children too. So here is where we complement one another. And here is where when we look at the figures, we have to 
pressure government to respect the rights, the human rights of all in this society. They are. Um, yeah. Go ahead. You no, I just wanted to add, and that's why, as unions, we also add that a recurrent discussion at the International Labor Conference every year is the social protection floor. Now, as Mr. Isroon indicated, that social protection floor, you can only get the numbers also. If you go to SVV to ask any numbers, they can only tell you from the formal economy those that are registered fire employers organization but all the unregistered persons that needs to have or unemployed persons that needs to have for example a doctor card and either a uh, 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 on the stunt to be able to you know complement their income etc um where do we get all of that insight into seeing how the build up is and the necessity why the minister has to then call for let's um how you say regulate the local hiring the local first and foremost over a foreign application for a work permit i don't see what's really wrong with it i'm um, when i when i read this thing from the shta I, the next program i had at this you know, kind of described as being disrespectful, insulting, and to a degree racist. And the only thing I saw, because I saw government call me things like this before urgent business parliament, one was when the uniform services raided a hotel that had a load of foreigners employed, and government thought that was, in the sense that there's been no raid, so that the, the illegals are allowed to do what they want. But only thing that came out of this meeting that I could you know, discern from what parliament is, oh, there's a counterpart policy, and we can have them um, use the counterpart, but it has never been, not even in government. Work. Government had it, exactly. and government never used it. Exactly. So, how do we now use that and an excuse? As I said, I don't know to what end this meeting was called, but the counterpart policy and the, the, the continued um, talk of um, lack of skills. We have NEPA doing a good job. We don't have all the 11,000, but, but these people should be employed. Then we know that we're on the right track. We cannot train 1,800 people and bringing 3,000 foreigners to work? Well, it's not only NIPA that is doing a good job. Eh? We have, on a yearly basis, children that are graduating from Sundial, which is a PSVE, a preparatory mm -hmm. yeah. secondary vocational education type um, of education, also from the St. Martin Academy in different areas and different yeah. sectors. So, basically, from... Um, the different streams, there are children that would be able to continue a continue learning track, and they are the ones that might go to Lipa, NIPA, but there are children that would go to the labor market, okay? And with the skills that they have obtained at the PSVE, when they go into the labor market, they, they are the ones that should be able to get certain jobs. We know for years Sundial has been um, dealing with hospitality, with care. They also have um, the stream for administration, etc. Okay? So, um, I don't believe that with this policy, the minister is targeting when it comes to, um, let's say, doctors, teachers, mm -hmm. or some um, other t forms like that. But um, the... <coughs> the labor market keeps throwing out all the time, or the, the workers' organizations keep throwing out that there's not a match. Now, I would like to know, if there is not a match between these schools, where is the role that they would play? It should be their obligation also as employers to have that input in these um, streams, to make sure that our students become employable. And if these um, areas of education is making sure that children go to job training, you know, so that they can get experience at the job, etc. <coughs> sorry. Then we should also enforce that the advisory council on the, on the labor and education, so RAT, on the race and um, arbeit, 
the ROA be installed. The last uh, meeting that this advisory body held was under the Netherlands Antilles where they then approved what we know today as um, the SP1 and the SP2 um, uh, educational area that NIPA also gives that, that certification. Um, those are actually the persons that we qualify to be able to, to work in preschools or preschools, the SP1 and the SP2 uh, type of course. That was the last. After 10, 10, 10, we keep insisting that we would need that type of, um, you know, continuation because even the, the IFE, which is the, the, um, the training institution for nurses, mm -hmm. they were um, actually vetted via that, com um, that advisory council also. Today we saw, not exactly today, I mean, in our society now we saw that NIPA went ahead and they got um, uh, an association with a training, a nursing training facility. And we know also that because of the lack of skilled um, um, persons in the area of care, the hospital, the St. Martin Medical Center, had stayed the, taken on that role and have been internally preparing students for the market of nursing. So, therefore, as employers' organizations, instead of putting, how you would say, um, a whip at certain policies, they should also have more an, a more active role in playing within this this market. We saw that, for example, WIFL, which regrettable Brother Thompson didn't reach us yet, but as a union in the hospit in the hospitality field, they have created to be able to have their um, how you say members employable at all times because sometimes you know it shifts the market shifts uh, when you started out as um, let's say in certain areas and they become um, redundant that you can be still you know effective in hospitality so they have had a number of training sessions for their members along that line they have also trained let's say for the hotels the people that would do um, um, the rooms, or the room attendants, to a certain standard, because the market started to put standards to people that clean the room. They were no longer just cleaners, you know. You, 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 within the market of she etc., you have to make the room look like um, the person's home, so that it can accommodate them. So all those trainings were being done via the CSEF. A lot of TVET, as we would call them, trainings, <laughs> bartender and room attendants and different things, even to upgrade the members with computer skills. Because when computers started to become, you know, the art of the day in the workplace, you needed to get some people that um, was a custom of the Underwood typewriters. You had to get them, you know, change in the skill and in the mindset of computers. So the whole um, reservation at hotels became computerized and um, it is sad to see that some employers just take this opportunity in St. Martin to only make money and do not com contribute back to the social development of the people of our country. So mm -hmm. I agree with uh, Claire that um, it is very important that uh, long life learning is being promoted. Now, who has to promote long life learning? Government. Now, government is only having attention for the formal education. You go to primary school, you go to secondary, secondary. school, and you can even go to the university. But even that is a problem because for you to go there, government has to also structure the law and put the finances, put the money where your mouth is. So what we see, no money for retraining of people, 
re providing people with new training opportunities, right? So even when you talk NIPA, they are underfinanced by government. So what you see is that do we really want the people to get their right to work realized? If we don't even provide them with sufficient opportunities to be better <coughs> schooled, be better trained, and if we all only think of to finance this, it's government has to put the money. Let me tell you in the past, when you entered in a company, you can start as a bellboy. But then they sent you and they trained you within the company or they sent you to get your training and the company was paying. No, they want to check them out of that. And they expect government to pay all of that. Now we are happy that the Dutch government said, yes, we want to do it. Because guess what? The emergency income support and training program paid the student to come. <coughs> Thousand dollars a month paid the institution, the, the, the foundation that is set up to provide the training courses. And all that money was not from local government, it was from the Dutch government. So we happy because if you could do that for 1,800 students, bring the rest. Because it's more than 1,800 students we have in this society that need additional training that are out of the schooling system. And so with that said, it brings us back again to the number. 11,000, let it sink in. It's more than almost the 1,800 that they put there. And so where is the money for the rest? It should come. Don't wait too long because we're talking about 11,000 since 2018 waiting. But we went back in the figures for the labor force survey. And since then, then, then more than 10,000 people in our society, they are not seen. They are not represented. They are not being catered to for them to be realizing their right to work. So with that said, as a consumer coalition, we have to stand up for them because that's what we have championed for, to represent them. They all are being turned over tax. Even the parliamentarian that getting his money is because of turnover tax coming in. Also some other taxes. But that turnover tax from everybody in this society, you're either documented or not, right? What happened is this. Sorry that I'm so excited. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but this is where we are in this society. What happens is that all these people come to me. They come to me. They come to us with their concern. Mm -hmm. And when they come with their concern, and you see this is structurally an abuse happening in this society, we stand up. We speak out. It's for years that we're talking about give them an equal opportunity. Give them an equal right. But it is like people telling you, you like John the Baptist. You speaking alone there in the wilderness. But it's not true. All these organizations that we represent, they know this too. They want to see the difference too. And so what we say is, by speaking out for more opportunities, let the Dutch hear it good, good. We always <coughs> look at our own government to provide the monies for education, for training, for job creation, for all of that. But the right that we have to work is a human right. And because it is a human right, it is not only the local government that <coughs> has to <coughs> help us and to protect this right, it is the kingdom government that has to guarantee this right. And so when I have to put a guarantee, if you lend me some money, and you ask me, ah, boy, your money not enough. So <laughs> I need someone else to, as a guarantee. When you can't pay, who has to pay? The guarantor. The guarantee, the guarantor. So Holland, here we come. We support our government to come and to demand that 
all our human rights are being respected in this part of the kingdom and put your money where your mouth is we have to bring it like this for you to understand that what we talk is based on human rights it's based on the charter of the kingdom article 43 it states clearly for the realization of our human right that's every country affair but for the guarantee that I get my, my, my human rights realized that's a kingdom affair so if I don't have enough money listen carefully to the CFT telling you hey you don't have that money you can't put more money there in your budget so then instead of the CFT telling we you're not complying they have to go back to the kingdom government and tell them where is your compliance with article 43 of the charter of the kingdom your guarantee you have to pay now you as the guarantor according to article 43 from the charter of the kingdom but what you see for years cft talking bashing our government and all the media in call in inquire they copy and they say what cft said even our parliamentarians bashing our own government and none of them has the guts to tell the dutch put your money where your mouth is you also have a responsibility it's you has the guarantee function so we are so happy with irma not because of all the damage that we suffered and all the pain that we went through but all of a sudden the dutch realized we have to give some money now we can discuss if that was done well one thing is sure the world bank already came up with a progress report for the emergency support income support and training program where they say yuppie we almost spent all the money because in june now the program is over and we have already reached almost the 1800 students that we wanted to make employable and guess what every time the press is invited graduation ceremony for a certificate not for a diploma for a certificate after six months training of course we like it because the dutch put the money there they have to give an account they got their account but now you have the consumer coalition telling you hey don't forget the others too how much of the others need to get that money too you see where we come from someone has to stand up and what we hope is that the press instead of only copying what his master's voice is dictating look it up for yourself what we are saying you can copy it you can see it too it's our rights for all of us in this society so with that we applaud the initiative to invite us based on this so-called discrepancy in the figures from the minister and the consumer coalition we're happy that you invited us because now we can explain and the people out there they know exactly what we're saying because they were not seen in the numbers from the from the government but we see them we see them we talk for them and that's what we have to do make sure that everybody can realize their human right so talking about labor policy talking about employment recruitment policy very good but that is only for the vacancies you see where we come from the vacancies government said employment permits it's about a thousand to thousand five hundred a year that was the the, the, the the most that he signed in a year it's thousand vacancies but it is eleven thousand people that is looking for a job a formal job understand me where are those vacancies where are those jobs so you can't say government you have to do that local government because if they could they have done it long time this is now where we are government and society have to demand from the kingdom government to comply with the international treaties 
that is saying we have human rights. These human rights sh should be realized, and according to the Charter of the Kingdom, they should be even guaranteed. By who is the guarantor? The Kingdom government. Article 43 of your Charter of the Kingdom. There are some people in this country that have my concern, the so-called boys on the block, and they're not fitting into this um, equation because of this so-called skills that we don't have. Who, if anybody, verifies these skills that the, the foreigners come in with to work and sell t-shirts in gold in Phillipsburg that the boys on the blocks could not do? You say the boys on the block, but they have boys and girls on the block. <laughs> well, well, I said boys <coughs> is general. Yeah. But I fully agree with you because I was brought up here in St. Martin and you know that our front street, can jewelers, Spritz and Foreman, mm -hmm. back then El Globo, they were all the local workforce. And um, that was quality gold. When I tell you quality gold, gold that stands out after 40 years, you still have your gold. And it is very, very um, surprising to see that today Front Street hardly have any locals. If they have locals, they're not... Um, in, in the type of jobs that actually um, we knew back then when we grew up, and jewelers and all of those other, um, you know, and these persons would let, would request, um, let's say, licenses or even permits for directors, ge gemologists, yeah, or yeah. And, and, and different things like that. And when you double check, the standard of what they are saying in their vacancy list, it is actually just sales clerks. Um, people that have to sell to the tourists, motivate the tourists, explain them, etc. And these are things that put you to wonder. And these are things that at a given moment enough is enough and have also triggered the department to say, oh, well, the, let's, you know, fill in exactly to be, avo to be able to avoid this. I went yesterday to a bakery in Cold Bay on the welfare road and I was surprised. I took pictures but because they are now going to close on Tuesdays because they cannot um, fill the vacancies that they have. I forgot to take the picture of the vacancy lifts but from reading and what I remember like there was a pastry person, a part-time driver, um, let's say about five vacancies and I find it was very very strange so I took the picture of this um, you know and then only to find out the labor office and the government still cannot with all this policy etc they still cannot oblige uh, or demand from an employer to hire a local so it is <coughs> saying yes on one side Yes, um, based on what article in the law would it be that uh, um, any, any business or any employer have to employ a local? It, it, it shows you then that the hula hoop that is going on is really, again, to throw a number of, of things that people are to blind people or to get people, you know, emotionally work up. Because if there is no law or article in the law to say the word must, we are saying we're going to look at this and then if not, no, um, no permit will be granted for the foreigner if uh, you have a local. But when you send a local and the, they play games in the interview with the local and they as employers say the local is not a match and they still don't employ the locals and you can hear of numerous examples when the labor office would call they would even play the tune of the vacancy is no longer available and then you would ask um, oh so you got somebody to fill it no so all of a sudden the restructure and, and, and the vibe of they are no longer available that type of vacancy then you see that it's games they're playing and that's why you you mentioned it just now the 
the statement of the charter is so disrespectful because I don't know that the charter as social partner had that type of tone and authority to be telling a minister you have to retract you have to retract that if the minister can't tell you as employer you must employ a local because there is no article to say that but it's just you know given a structure of it will be denied if we have a local that can fill this and you come with such a statement then in my opinion and correct me if i'm wrong you are very disrespectful to our honorable minister of labor that in this um in this position has exercised her rights and her authority to be able to structure certain things because <clears throat> as a labor union I would expect that if the charter had a problem with any parts of that, then they would do the rightful and respectful thing to either put it in writing or to request a meeting from the minister to be able to address this issue in a respectful manner. Now, even um, the ministers won, but even for them to go that far and, you know, I quote from the Daily Herald of last week hmm. to say that most work permits that are granted last year, 25% were for the adult entertainment sector. And then they have the audacity to say that they would like to know if this industry is going to be forced to follow the same labor rules. Nobody is forcing nobody. The minister has structured the the you know the rules now keeping a list of locals qualify for the job and having a government employee sit in in the interview well i feel that that's disrespectful to our local workers also and uh, basically um why are they only mentioning the adult entertainment sector there are so many sectors within the maritime sector the hospitality sector so many other sectors that um that provides decent work i'm not trying to qualify that the adult entertainment is such undecent work but the fact that you are going to single them out and then you want to know if this is going to um, um how you say apply to the local workforce this is disrespectful phenomenal women of this country have to tell Shato what they have to say which is you are a set of disrespectful club members because um when we go now as a labor union to look at them yeah we are not even um, defining them as a workers organization they are just a club of 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 some people that came together if you are targeting things in a respectful manner we can share and we can talk with you but when it comes to this level of disrespect against the minister and against the female local workers then we have a problem with that and therefore i would like to demand that the shatter tender apology public apology for the disrespectful way of you know addressing this issue that I am, I am quite surprised that only from the consumer coalition i heard a demand for for an apology even parliament itself it seems like only part of the article they read because they didn't see that part and there's no apology that is quite okay we abuse of our people and speak to us how we want we seem to be acceptable to that mm -hmm. but nobody else except your group asked for an apology the unions also strange. is um on that page also the unions represented in the week loop we are also on that page and um i heard a number of of persons in radio programs especially on sos also saying the same thing also yesterday i had a privilege to hear part of mr barry joe's program culture time and he also mentioned it and when it came on facebook there was a number of reactions but the fact is that i truly and wholeheartedly believe that the statement as such is disrespectful to both parties the women 
and to the minister. And as a social partner, if you don't know your role, mm -hmm. you should have realized that this issue should have had a different tone. Well, I, I, I would just simply say who they think they are. Mr. Yusurun, I see you looking up at my clock. It's not there for you, it's for me. <laughs> um, but I want to crunch some numbers with you before we go. Um, we Back in 2014-15, government instituted a study on minimum wage versus livable wage. I still can remember the figure. It was 4,000 years, 222, 22, US, 22 US dollars, 2,222. And um, th that report was never made. It wasn't made public to the people. But the fact is, nothing was done on the minimum wage versus livable wage. The minimum wage has remained the same. Not only remained the same, but there are people that are working in perpetuity in minimum wage. So 10, 20 years, they're still on minimum wage. How do we address this specific issue? Well, the first thing that we have to say is that when uh, Transparency International came out with this report, they used the statistical data of the census of 2011. Mm -hmm. So they came up with this amount of people that had a household income of less than 4,000 guilders a month. That's the 2,222 US dollars. Yes. But that is the combined income in the household. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about to get 4,000 guilders, Papa and Mama have to get work if Papa and Mama is in the household. Yep. So Papa need 2,000 guilders at least, Mama need 2,000 guilders at least to make at least the 4,000 guilders to have this amount that was calculated for 2011. Mm -hmm. Now we are in 2020, and with the index that went up of the consumer prices, mm -hmm. I can tell you 4,000 right now in St. Martin is around 5,000 guilders. That's number one. So how we go about it? Look at how the cost of living came up and what is needed not to be in poverty. Next thing. Even yesterday, we were criticized in another radio program on another medium, anti-poverty platform. They citing research from elsewhere. Some people don't get it. <coughs> Let me tell you. When the people from Transparency International, they're not from yesterday, they're very knowledgeable. They said, well, St. Martin has no study on what is the poverty line. So, they said the cost of living in St. Martin, as they could compare it with Bonaire, in St. Martin was much higher than in Bonaire. So they said, wow, there was a study of the National Institute for Budget Information done in the Netherlands. They did it for Bonaire. And so they concluded that for people not to be in poverty in Bonaire, they need at least 4,000 guilders a month. So what did Transparency International say that it should be higher in St. Martin. But let me use the 4,000 guilder to see how many people already <coughs> don't make it. And that was 75%. There was three out of four households in St. Martin. Then our own government with a household budget <laughs> survey five years later came to the conclusion it is not seven out of ten. It is not three out of four. It is nine from the ten. Don't have the 4,000 guilders as a combined income. So when we talk poverty, don't fool we, because we don't make the ends. We represent all those people. And so whoever comes and talk against what we are saying, <coughs> who they are representing. Because as consumers coalition, as anti-poverty platform, we talk this reality. And so whoever <coughs> comes attacking the consumer coalition, attacking the anti-poverty platform, they attacking all of these poor and needy households. That's our conclusion. And so how shall we go about those people? How shall we go about even government that doesn't want to address these figures and as I told you we are going to do the index for this 4,000 guilders 
we already know it's about 5,000 guilders per household right now. And how to address it? We're waiting for the new government to sit in. The new government has to swear in. Because we go now to the sitting government. You know. Yeah. There's a new government coming in. We, we, we wait for the new to come. And they have to address it now. What was so remarkable was that a number of persons <coughs> contesting the January 2020 elections also campaigned with the slogan of living wage, etc. However, from 2016, the minimum wage has not been indexed. Last year, in the January of 2019, when the consumer coalition um how you would say uh, okay kick up dust about the social premiums not being indexed mm -hmm. then they were indexed retroactively up to um january in february they were indexed retroactively up to january 2000 and uh, no sorry 2019 mm -hmm. yes okay. so the month before but how were they indexed with uh out of the finger they suck um a so-called tripartite committee where labor was not involved were put together quickly hurriedly hastily by the minister minister lee and it was indexed with a 2.7 on the social premiums so the old age pension and um orphanage widows and disability pension but no index was provided to the um how you would say to those that have um a minimum wage the minister at that time promised that it would be done for january 2020 it hasn't been done as yet but what was so remarkable was that the minister insisted at that time because of um certain things within a pre-roll program they could not index the minimum wage retroactively and I was like wow uh, yeah. um, I have been in the system when the court cases was one for equal work equal pay and all of that equal work equal pay payments to married w uh, women divorced single men single women with or without children all of that was paid in 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 uh, how you would say in stages and it was retroactive payment and the tax office got their part all the social premiums got their part so it's strange that we have smartphones smart um all kind of smart computer smart tvs etc but no smart calculators <laughs> within the, no um to to calculate this and make sure that retroactive payments to this tone can be done I, I, I it's regrettable and it's heartbreaking and I do hope that when the new minister sits in he or she would find it fitting to do what we call the um, the indexation on the minimum wage and also make sure that we can have them retroactive because i just cannot um how is it comprehend with all the smartness that is going on in technology why it would be such a based on whatever laws such a a, a challenge that this cannot be done okay um radio listen we're coming to the end of the program one thing i want to touch before we go with my good friend who is um we see that uh, the um, Samaritan Housing Development Foundation has been asking for some input from government to build some things. How do you see the forward um, projection of affordable or low-income housing in St. Martin, and can we really call it low-income? First of all, we thank the St. Martin Housing Foundation to go to Parliament and to inform Parliament of the challenges that they have been facing from their inception because a lot of things came to the light that we didn't know because we have people that we represent 
that have issues with the service that the St. Martin Housing Foundation was providing. But now by them giving clarity, we see that it was politics that had actually strangled them so that they could not provide maintenance the way it should be. We also see that the Dutch funding is still not in place after the hurricane. But then, what is still bothering us is that the Housing Development Foundation is only addressing a certain amount of social homes. If nine of the ten households in St. Martin is in poverty, it's nine of the households need social housing. You understand? So, in the report of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, the World Bank calculated with the Vromi that Hurricane Irma showed that 70 to 80 percent of the homes had been destroyed structurally, which means to say that 13,000 to 15,000 housing units were structurally damaged. So if we talk about structurally damaged homes, where 94% of the households is in poverty, they cannot reconstruct, they cannot rebuild. So a human right to adequate housing, again, has not been realized. Before Irma, because if it was before Irma, structural housing, then it would not have been damaged. But now we see it is still a need for this society that 13 to 15,000 homes are being built. Now, what we did as Consumer Coalition, we said this takes too long. From 2017, that we were hit by Irma, and we are now in 2020, almost three years later, and the latest figures that we got is that not even the thousand homes were built or were rebuilt better. So we said, we go to our legal advisor, our lawyer, and we are working on a case to bring government and the kingdom government to court. Because according to Article 43, it is a human right for you to have adequate housing that should be realized by your government. But with CFT telling government you don't have the money, then what is it? The guarantor has to step in. And so, the guarantor who put money at the World Bank far away, 580 $50 million. Dollars. $450. And what was there for social housing? The project for income support and training, he people hooray, right, after two years, almost finished. They reported. But no report about social housing that they have been building for the 13,000 to 15,000 households that their homes have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. So, how we go about it? I told you already. We will start a court case because this thing taking too long. By the way, the National Recovery and Resilience Plan Bureau we have issues with them too. Consumers coming to us with their concern. These people employing contractors to repair the homes, they pretending that they will build back better and stronger. You see all the billboards in the neighborhoods? Well, let me tell you, we still have to see the build back better social homes here in St. Martin. We are addressing right now issues from consumers that are complaining about the quality of the Building Back program. Mm. We are addressing this right now with the NRPB. Boy, if I have to detail you the back and forth and the games that is being played by the NRPB, that's another program. We'll do that another day. <laughs> Radio listeners, mm -hmm. TV viewers, I'd like to thank my guest, Madam Elsha. Thank you for coming on the program. Don't be a stranger. I'd also like to thank Mr. Zishurun. We hope we have been able to bring you the information you need. 
we have been a bit over time, but it's with good information we usually do that. We'd like to thank you for tuning into the program. It's been a pleasure having you on board today. Do join with us again tomorrow, God's willing, for more information that affects our people and our community. This is the end of the morning show. Goodbye. Have a good day.